Good afternoon. Hi, how are you, Rochelle? Right, how about yourself? I'm well, thanks for asking. You know, a time of COVID here, um, it's, it's good to report. The vaccination is good. I'm all, all well. Excellent, excellent. May I ask you to please tell us your name? Yeah, Dr. Uh, Stephen Haley. Uh, I've been interim president of UB until recently, and now I've moved over into another role. What's UB? It's the University of Bridgeport, and I've been at the university since 1998. Uh, joined the faculty as an assistant professor and uh, worked at that for a number of years, became an associate professor with tenure, and then joined the administration and served uh, a bunch of different roles, but as dean of the School of Arts and Sciences, as associate provost, as provost, and, and now recently as interim president. Is that what you are now, interim president? Um, I, uh, technically through June 30th, though I've stopped using it because the University of Bridgeport uh, 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 underwent a transaction and Goodwin University um, purchased uh, the, the debt of the university and it's uh, the it so-called OPEID number so the academic identity of the university, and there's a new University of Bridgeport, and, and new just defines um, it, the the name will be University of Bridgeport, but new just defines that it's a new entity, and then the corporate name from the University of Bridgeport that I'm employed by will surrender its name to University of Bridgeport. Then we will have a name for this entity to close it down. And that, that takes from 12 to 18 months to do that. And technically I remain interim president of that through June 30th. And then I would be um, provost emeritus reflecting my, my long-term service as provost of University of Bridgeport uh, going forward. Excellent, thank you for that. So, so let, let, me, let me go back and ask a few questions. So my doctorate is in higher education administration. And I remember when I was getting my degree, the first course we took was about higher education, i.e. The, the founding of Harvard, you know, the mission of higher education and, and all mm -hmm. of that. And in your own words, how would you describe higher education in its most innocent, innocent uh, perspective. So is it simply to embed knowledge to those who wish to learn, or does higher ed have a higher purpose? Uh, no pun intended. <laughs> yeah, well, um, it's, a, it's a service to students, and, and at least in my view, uh, it's the highest possible purpose, because essentially what it's doing is taking the, the prospect of human development through technical means and through technical education and general forms of education, but it's taking on the task of human development as a professional enterprise with people who have given their lives to learning a subject matter, learning methods, uh, learning research strategies and experimental methods and all of that range of stuff to help students find the pathway to the brightest possible future for themselves and that always affects everybody. It affects their family. It affects um, not only the family that they're raising and becoming over time, but the family from which they came. Uh, it, it, and, and then because of that, it, it involves the community in which they're serving and the larger society. And, and, and call me an optimist or a large scale thinker, but I think this form of education affects the totality of stuff because it's really out of these forms of uh, learning and, the, and, and all of the technologies and, and the, um, the, the modes of adaptation and, and all of those things that come out of this learning are what's created the possibility for globalization and international travel. I mean, everything you think of involves all of these forms of knowledge in, in ways that are very, very hard to see even how they flow together. It's like massive kinds of tribut tributaries going into a, a, an overall like um, 
major river of human knowledge and, and who did what, when, and all that, you can't even pry it apart. So, so the education, the project of it affects the largest possible scale. At least that's what I think. That's why I'm interested in doing it. Absolutely. So tell, tell me, how, do you, how does the structure of a university come to be or a college come to be? So, how, you know, so I understand, you know, you, you create a job description, you do job searches and you hire, but how do you decide, you know, president, provost, vice provost, you know, deans, you know, uh, department chairs and, and so forth and so on until you get to the minutia of the faculty and the students. How is that structure decided and why does that structure work or is there room for improvement in that structure? Um, well, this is, a, this is an interesting question. One of the things that I've never done is create one of these structures from, you know, a tabula rasa. I've, I've always worked in structures that exist already. And you, and I'm not an expert in higher education history, but I do know enough of it to say, you know, the foundations and roots of this go back to the early modern period or what we sometimes call the middle ages. Um, and the foundation of, of universities, um, you know, for theological training, language training, philosophy, law, medicine. And then in the United States, and you're referring to Harvard, I mean, th these most ancient, or not ancient, but the, the oldest serving ones here in the, in the United States pre-exist um, the United States. You know, they were, they were in the period bef before that. Uh, and they develop structures to serve the purposes. And, and, and the structures would always be teaching and engaging students on a discipline. And, and originally, you know, frequently it was something like divinity and these sorts of things. And then the additional sciences that came in. And then you, w once you get to a certain scale, you need to start building uh, additional things to uh, administer it. And then over time, those get developed. And then in higher education history, additional kinds of movements come in. You have land grant colleges and then creating of state colleges. You have a period of creating of uh, community colleges. Uh, and the University of Bridgeport came out of that period. Its, its oldest identity goes back to the 1920s, 1927, the Junior College of Connecticut. And then over time, it grew and built and, and became uh, chartered uh, as a university, I, 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 I want to say in the 1940s or 1950s, certainly by 1950 it was that. And then over time it um, took other entities into itself. Uh, 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 the, the School of Education here came out of a prior entity. Our School of Nursing came over from the Bridgeport Hospital School of Nursing and was incorporated into our School of Engineering. So the university grew over time by this process of incorporating other things within itself and, and now uh, is incorporated within the Goodwin University as, um, as, as a um, subsidiary of Goodwin University, but it still has, um, and beginning on July 1st, a, a separate or actually beginning now, it's, it's begun now as a separately accredited institution with its own board, its own president and, and provost and administration. Anyway, that's more than you asked, but that's some, st <laughs> some stuff kind of came to mind in this category of university structures and how they get built. Absolutely, that makes perfectly good sense. So, so okay, the part that higher ed has I think in a lot of ways been kind of roughed up a little bit and then is that is the cost of a college education yeah so sure. when, you, when you when you look at this thing and we look look like you just did historically look back so a part of early education even before we got to the uh I guess the structure of what we call education now part of it was more you know, to help people maintain their family businesses or their family farms or their family lives. So, you know, and they wanted children to be instructed in money management and, you know, business and all of these different things. You know, the, 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 the religious or theological part of, part of education, you know, serves its own purpose. And I don't know how you turn that into what we are today in terms of education, but all of that, 
but we wanted our children to be able to have an education so that they could be productive either in their families or on their own or in their own families. And it has gotten so what was once an honorable thing has become a burden for a lot of students to go to school. So students opt out, uh, they go to other types of schools. So online education has taken a big you know, part of the market now. The competitiveness of universities has been really important, but it has become so expensive that you know, it used to didn't be that people would say, well, we don't know if we can afford to send our child. To, everybody was going to send their child to college that could send their child to college who understood what this, this meant. But now it's gotten to the point, can we afford to send our children to college? And when you have a system that has been almost bent backwards on itself between for ethnicity such as black and brown people to deny them the right of education, and now they want to come get education, it has become almost, you know onerous or or burdensome to even go get that get that education why is it that structure that that the the university system creates that causes the cost and the rise of what an education costs Do you, can you identify or pinpoint any reason why getting a college degree now is so expensive i i, I can give a shot at it it's a, it's a very complex um issue and, I, and i'm not an economist but but um and I'm blanking on the name of the economist that originally put an idea to, 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 that, I, that I read uh, that's informed some of how I think about this, which is, and he was pointing out that um, education like healthcare, which is another area of tremendous inflation in, in the cost, the cost of healthcare, the cost of education. He was pointing out that those are two areas that efficiencies um, that allow for um, handling a increased volume ha has, a, has an upper limit on it. You have a professor teaching students, um, regardless of the level, in kindergarten uh, uh, up to doc doctoral work, there's only so many you can reasonably do. Um, you can't roboticize, well, I guess you could, you know, you could use artificial intelligence and roboticize feedback and stuff like that. And in some sense, that's that 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 is already happening, and it will continue to do. But when you want to give personal attention to people, a person can give attention to only so many people. And and the economy of education, and, and a person can only be a doctor or a nurse or a specialist caregiver for only so many. And and those enterprises are in a context where the rest of the economy whether it's technology of production um, or, or, or communication or, or other sorts of things in the economy have um, you know, increases in efficiency and scale that dwarf anything that education and, and medical care can do. They're at the upper limit. And so by reference to those other parts of the economy, which are frequently deflating, I mean, if you, you go out and buy a a 60 inch television. Uh, now, you, you may, I don't know, I haven't done it, but you, you maybe could buy one for $500. And, and um, you know, it wasn't that long ago, it would have been $10,000. And literally, that's the deflationary pressure on that. And some of these technologies, um, like, like the iPhone, you know, I carry around, they're, they're reinventing these things constantly, and they're putting in a bunch of new uh, bells and whistles, tools, and all this stuff, fighting against other corporate entities like like this cell phone. You know, is preventing Google and Facebook from tracking you around. So they're they're trying to add value because otherwise the the cost of these things would be going down. Right. So so the economies. This is not a full answer to the question of the cost of education, but it's a partial one. And then the other thing I would say, two other things, and, and forgive the length of the answer. One is that certainly the University of Bridgeport, where I'm at, has always gone to the end of the line to keep a control on costs. And if you looked at our undergraduate tuition, as it's stated, every student essentially gets, in addition to federal financial aid and whatever state financial aid might come in, for state of Connecticut residents through 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 a program here, the Roberta Willis uh, Scholarship Program. Um, in addition to those, the university has uh, a merit and need-based discounts that it 
that applies. It also recruits a significant number of athletes who get a discount for that. And so what we are trying to do in every instance is produce for students an education that will give them wheels, you know, to their future at a cost that's reasonable and something that they can manage. And I'm pretty proud of it. And I think that we do a good job with it. And state, uh, states also fund, um, you know, higher education at, at variety of levels from community colleges up to you know, flagships that grant PhDs, and those all have workforce needs and, and, and economies uh, kind of built into them for state, for state residents. And so I think as a whole, this idea that higher education lacks value um, is um, a misplaced suspicion about value. <laughs> I, th I think the professions are under doubt as well, you know, journalists and media, um, uh, uh, these sorts of things, and other things like people of color are under doubt, uh, Asian Americans and Jews are under doubt. I mean, it's as if there's a very broad kind of anxiety that is targeting either individuals uh, or groups or people based on their, their um, ethnic or racial background or value creating entities or value preserving entities as somehow the problem. And the, and the problem is not that. The problem is that the country is at a period of change and we have a vague awareness that everything is at stake uh, and we have a, a more than vague awareness that we are un Unify. We're, you know, we are not together in defining the future. So we have radical polarization and political politicization. And so instead of confronting those things and solving them in our body politic, instead we're blaming education. We've been blaming education for a long time. It used to be that higher education would almost, and I have to say, join the criticism and somehow blame K-12 education for not bringing us students that were up to snuff or, or, or whatever. This was wrong then, and it's wrong now. Now that higher education is one of the targets of these criticisms, some of us have woken up and hopefully feel bad for whatever earlier statements we may have made because they were wrong. I mean, education is not perfect. Educators are not perfect, uh, but it's a noble vocation. Uh, and we're here to help people build their lives, grow their lives, add skills, conquer the future, and, and really to do it as a, as a society where we all have increased forms of access and participation and wealth sharing and all of that. So I'm not gonna be pushed off of this idea that education is valuable and it's worth the value that it charges because it is worth it. So I, I, would, I would question that. Um, and I, wanna, I wanna give you a couple of examples. Okay. Elite universities pay their research faculty significant sums of money. I know faculty who make four and $500,000 a year to teach you know, maybe 20 hours a week, research 65 or 75% of their time to produce more, more scholarship and the success rate of those students are more times than not their own doing as opposed to that of the faculty or the administration because of the competitive nature of higher education specifically you know so am i going to go to harvard am i going to go to yale am i going to go to nyu am i going to go to where am i going to go and the question becomes the school starts just really nice things so you go to campus you know it's absolutely stunning campus the, the grass is greener than you've ever seen the cafeteria serves filet mignon you know you can go play foosball and you know all, you've got all of these amenities that they bring to the school to pull students in but while you're paying faculty these absorbent salaries, while you're building all these amenities, the students in a lot of ways are the people that are in most jeopardy in that arrangement. Because if you're coming to a school and it's set in this structured way that higher education is set, where you go to school, you go to class, you've got all these rules, you gotta have so many hours in the seat, you've gotta have all these different things that has to happen. Where does someone take care of the student in that process? 
and my 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 shoot off from that is historically black colleges versus predominantly white colleges. So mm. I have three degrees from historically black colleges mm. throughout my entire my two undergraduate degrees and my master's degree. Every faculty member I knew I had knew my name, knew my family, knew anything that happened to me. So if I got a promotion in my job, if I lost my job, if I whatever happened. They knew me. I was a part of a family. And to this day, it's been forever since I graduated, but I'm still a part of that family. I'm always welcome back. I'm always encouraged to contribute. Where's my doctorate degree is from predominantly white college. And the only email I get from them is to send money. You know, please send your money to us. That's what I want. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a seven digit number to them, even to this day. You know, I still have my my email from them and it contains my seven digit number. And so when you and, and, and I, I have I was a non traditional student, but I work with a lot of students and I will tell you, many of them have imposter syndrome. They don't feel like they belong. They don't understand the whole process that's there. They don't know where to go when they're in trouble. You know, so, you know, the faculty member says we have office hours between this time and that time. If you don't get into those office hours, you may not get what you need. So in, in essence, if higher education is a noble function in our society, in other words, it perpetuates our economy, it makes glo our global uh, footprint bigger, and I get all that. So I see all the benefits of higher education, but I think it spun itself into this frenzy that has caused so many other things to attack it, right? So you've got online education. So COVID was a COVID forced us to that. But pre-COVID, you know, Coursera, edX, and all these other companies were, were challenging the traditional seats and chairs in front of faculty. They were saying, hey, you could do this digitally. I remember seeing a commercial, some girl sitting in her pajamas saying, I can go to class in my pajamas. They were challenging this notion that you had to go to a brick and mortar place in order to learn. And then you have added to that how much it costs to go to school. So now if I can go to online education, maybe it's cheaper than going to the brick and mortar. Plus, I may have a job. I may not be able to afford to you know, get a parking pass or whatever. So I've got all these things I've got to get to to get there. So if higher education is this noble thing, how does it recognize how it's being seen by the people who are coming to it, not necessarily the 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 public outside, you know, the media and all those, but I'm talking about just the students who are coming to school. <laughs> you know, uh, Rochelle, I'm I'm delighted we're having this conversation. <laughs> I love listening to you. Um, uh, there's a, a lot you say in there that that I share. There's some things that that I would put quite differently, and it's going to be not easy for me to respond to the totality of that, but okay, but I understand. I hear, I hear you. Uh, what you're saying. So, just a couple reactions. You know, one is, and maybe I could have put it a little differently, that the purposes of higher education are noble, and it doesn't mean that that every educational institution is channeling it in its absolute pure state at every instance. And higher education institutions can be drawn into things th that are less helpful. Um, but, but I also think that right now, uh, the criticisms that are being leveled against higher education, um, including some of the ones that you're, you're mentioning here, are, are, are painting with a broader brush that, than, than than is at least merited in the general instance. Um, so I don't know how to work on that outside of saying that different institutions should be encouraged to um, produce change to make sure that they are serving uh, a noble purpose and, and not being drawn off into things that just inflate cost if, if ever that's to be found or, or, or whatever else. Um, and I, I guess another reaction I have is that you were talking about, uh, you know, the undergraduate master's program you did at H HBCU, and then you had a different experience at, at, a, at a different university that, that served a great many more white students. And I, I don't know the, the institutions. I, I guess I looked at your LinkedIn profile a while ago, but I forget which they were. Uh, and so I can't really comment, but I would at least say that there are differences in how 
colleges um, and sometimes smaller ones that have a stronger sense of community work with students uh, than other larger institutional types of universities. And one is not, in, at least in, in my opinion, better than the other, but they are qualitatively different experiences. And it, and it affects the student learning and the uh, graduate and postgraduate and the alumni experience as a totality in each of them. And so I don't know exactly what's all involved in, in your experience, and I, I'm not gonna speak to it because I don't know, but speaking just generally, I, I would say that. And then another thing I guess I wanted to react to is, is the idea that the elite universities, you know, have some highly, highly compensated professors. There may be some, I, I frankly haven't met too many. It, I, I, you know, occasionally get to read about some uh, that have, um, you know, appointments with medical schools and th this sort of stuff. But elite universities also, and I have a few in mind, I, here I won't name names because it's not my business to do, uh, but they've taken steps to ensure that, that undergraduate students whose families make below a certain amount of money uh, d don't have to uh, borrow money to attend. And, and, and I'm not, they're not perfect. No, no institution that I know of is perfect, but they are responding to these pressures and they are aware of, and they have resources sufficient to offer education uh, to students that demonstrate need uh, and to help them close the gap on it, if, if, if not totally, at least partially, and, and, in, in, and in some instances, totally. And that's, that's good. Uh, they're, they're doing a good thing when they're trying to do that and hopefully they'll get continue to be successful fundraising for that purpose because a lot of them uh, fundraise uh, and successfully because of how esteemed they are for for many other purposes and two other things i guess i'll mention because you did you, <laughs> you did have a lot you said there um one is uh it, you didn't say that much about it but i responded to the idea of of research i mean these universities that are elite are domains of research enterprise and, and the quality of our lives are very largely affected by them and not always positively. And, you know, an elite university may have somebody working on a, you know, essentially working on a technology that could be turned into a weapon system, but they are promoting and finding uh, basic knowledge that, that can be used for medical science for here, you know, all those things uh, are not coming out of, um, you, you know, guesswork, they're coming out of sustained attention through methods and through discipline and through faculties and through research and through collaboration, through information sharing over time. Uh, and it's, it's re really, um, uh, something that we're indebted to, even if we do have qualms about some parts of, of, of what they've been doing. And there was one other thing, you know, and I felt like a minute ago, I was gonna be able to respond to one other thing, but now because, um, you know, I myself have talked at, at, at some length here, I've kind of forgotten what that was. <laughs> so I apologize. That's okay. I, I agree that, um the research that comes out of many of our institutions is pretty pow powerful. It has made major changes in our society. I just don't think it's only unique to higher education. I mean, you've got, you know, oh. the founder of, of, of uh, Apple did not graduate college. You know, uh, you, you've got lots of examples where people and their own innovative ideas, you know, move us forward through various means. Technology is one of those things that have not necessarily reconciled itself solely in the education domain. It's been a bunch of things that have, have advanced technology to the point that we are. I will only just say this one thing. Out of my, my two schools, so my, my, my undergraduate and graduate degrees from North Carolina Central University, which is here in Durham, North Carolina, and my graduate degree is from East Carolina. North Carolina Central is the only university I send money to. I pay my alumni dues every single month. I do not send any to East Carolina because I did not have a good experience coming out of there. And I would say, as, as a Black person, I'm not alone in my feeling about my experience with my predominantly white institution. I did not leave there with a good taste in my mouth. I, I got my degree, 
because I put forth the work and I had a really wonderful black faculty member and my, my, my doctorate degree who worked with me on my shortcomings. Um, for students in other universities that I work with who I'm not their faculty member, I'm not their advisor, I'm just someone, I hear the horror stories of what it's like to go to school. And there was a book that was written many years ago, it says, why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria? We are in 2021 and they're still sitting all together in the cafeteria. They may not be in the cafeteria, they might be in the park or wherever, but they're still that way because the feeling of belonging in that institution is not always there. Whereas at a historically black college, if you're a historically black person, you don't feel that, that tension or that imposter syndrome or that I don't belong or someone's questioning my, my, my placement here. Like, why are you here? You're taking up a seat, a perfectly white person, a perfectly good white person can take up. But I am not, I have no qualms with education other than to say this. So K-12 is the feeder for higher education. Mm -hmm. And the faculty at the higher education level gets to research, they have freedom, they get things that they can do to improve their, their scholarship, their, their, their teaching, all of that stuff. K-12 teachers are in a box that's defined by the curriculum that that school system has put in place for them. They're, they're confined to what it is that their leadership in that school wants you know, what the local local uh, LEA says that you should be doing. You've got all of these pieces that are confining elementary education. And so when people say, why aren't K-12 schools giving us better students? If they had the freedom that faculty have in colleges to learn, to grow, to, to create their own uh, coursework, you probably would have better students. But if you're expecting to teach to the middle and that's all you're teaching to the middle, People are going to fall out on both ends. People at the very top end of the learning scale and people at the very bottom are going to fall out. And so when what you get in higher education is a result of the limitations of K-12 elementary school, whether those teachers have to have teacher licenses, whether they have to have degrees. But if they don't have that opportunity to be creative and innovative, you're going to get the same cookie cutter student every single time. And some of them reach and achieve the very best and some of them do not. And unfortunately for a lot of us, the people that we are seeing now more of that, specifically in this time of COVID, are black and brown kids falling out of that structural learning model that in place learning took place at, at an elementary school or K-12 elementary. So I think that there is a reason why high res aren't getting these crackerjack students because they have had so many challenges just to make a student come through these schools and get out you know successfully and testing 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 and testing it might tell you something but if i were back in school and you tested me a lot i would do really well because i have a photographic memory i do not know i learned anything but i know if i saw it it was in my brain so i don't know what testing tells us other than to say that you know it does give you some information, but whether it gives you what you think you're getting, I'm not so sure. Yeah, well, th th these are um, really, really good insights to be sharing, uh, and, and I have some reactions. Uh, you know, one of the, one of the statements I, I, I heard, um, or I would put it in, in my own terms, is that we are not investing enough in K-12 uh, for sure, uh, and, and I would be in support of an increased investment there, and to make sure that the faculty, uh, the teachers, the faculty members, um, and the administrations in, in those enterprises have the ability to um, grow and develop, and that we care for that uh, as a society, as a social good, is, is really important uh, to make sure that there's racial uh, and ethnic and, and economic um, fairness and, and equity uh, so that uh, schools that are in areas that are less, schools that are in areas that are impoverished should, should not victimize children and, and the faculty members that commit to working there because the tax base is reduced. I mean, that's wrong. Uh, it's uh, in the state of Connecticut, uh, tax base uh, of the town determines the amount that's available for uh, K-12. And it's, it 
it, it makes for real problems. Uh, so we need to invest more in, in urban schools on, on a per capita may spend even more, but the issues that they're dealing with are even greater. So there, there's a lot of social work to be done in the background to work on, on that as well. And of course, it's political when it comes to proposing solutions and and you know the parties see different strategies to, to, to produce that. And I have a political point of view that I'll kind of keep out of it here. But certainly the idea that we need to uh, work socially as well as in the context of education to produce better educations. And then the, the other thing I would say is that I still find myself being somewhat unconvinced about the general statement that K-12 is somehow letting us down. I mean, there, there are these areas of real, real wounds, um, social, racial, economic inequalities that get per perpetuated through education because they're not being solved. And I, I don't wanna, I mean, if, if that's an issue that those are issues that need to be handled specifically with tools and methods about that, but, but, and you can't really subtract or, or abstract away from that because it's so integral to what we're talking about. But educators are producing high quality students in numbers. I mean, that, that hasn't ceased happening. It's just that we have systemic problems in there to continue working on. And, and it isn't that K-12 is letting us down. It's a social dynamic under, underlying it is where, and I think what your comment was, pointing to as well. We need to continue to double down on that and make a more perfect union. This is, this is the basic fundamental agreement we have. And we have a lot of work to do because it might be, and, and your comment suggests that it is, that we're, we're losing ground instead of gaining it. And that's terrible. In a lot of ways we are. And I think a part of it is the way we are structurally. And I don't think it's unique to the United States. I think it's the case across the entire globe. You know, there are these problems that exist in almost every community, you know, whether they're ethnic or whether they're economic or whatever they are, they exist. I just think that we hold ourselves out as the best of whatever the best is and however you quantify best, you know, and yet still, you know, there are societies like you take Japan or Finland, they do an amazing job of education without all of the bureaucracy of what we experience in education. You know, so they go to school on Saturdays, they go to school longer days, and they go to school for longer periods of time. Instead, of, we're still set on a varying calendar, you know, like we're still farmers. You know, we've got all these things that we make up about what we need to do to do things. And I think it would be really helpful if we really did have, you know, leaders across the entire spectrum of education, whether you're a president or provost or dean, whatever you are, or a faculty uh, member in elementary education or in higher education, all together thinking about how to solve these problems. If there were commissions to think about, here are the issues that we have. So if we're gonna admit low-income students, here are the resources we need to provide. If we are going to uh, admit students that are not at the level of, of, of college, rigor you know here are the things that we need to do and here's how we find out how to fix these things and we share them communally among all schools as opposed to say your school learning something and you keep it to yourself and i remember mercedes benz made this comment a long time ago about something they had discovered in the mechanics of car making that they said we're going to share this with everybody we're not going to just keep this for ourselves and i think that's what education should do education should have partnerships that go up and down they should go all the way down to kindergarten and all the way up to the doctoral program where there is information shared here's what works here here's what doesn't work here what we know and what we don't know and to constantly be working at that with, with diligence, you know, with diligence. You know, when you find a problem, you at least acknowledge the problem. Hey, we may not be able to solve it now, but, you know, we know this exists. And, 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 and I live in North Carolina. And so we got the lottery. I don't know, maybe we got the lottery 10 years ago. I don't remember. We were probably one of the last states to get the lottery. When we got the lottery, a good chunk of education funding that the legislature had done through other kinds of means they took profits from the lottery and applied that to education, which means they cut the education budget from what it was before the lottery and now supplemented it to some degree with the lottery. Well, you know, 
is that enough? I mean, why did we cut away the part that we were giving and then take take what the little the lottery gives us and then gives that to education? So in a lot of cases, you know, there are students who don't have books. You know, mm -hmm. they don't they can't afford to buy books in the school anymore. So, you know, not that I think printed material is the end all and begin all because it's outdated almost as soon as it's printed, but but nonetheless, printed materials, they don't always have that. So you've got all these things where education is constantly, especially elementary education, is taking a hit for some reason. And I think that that's where this kind of group of people who are thinking about education in a consistent way. So if you want your product, in other words, if you are making a car and the tire is gonna go on an axle, the person who is gonna put that tire on the axle needs the person down there that's making the tire to make it a make it a good tire. And if you think of education in that structural way, the people who are in elementary education, higher ed should have a vested interest in their success. They should be vested in their success because the product that the, the elementary education is going to produce is going to be your product soon. Yeah, yeah, for sure. There's so 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 many things you're sharing there that I think think are really, really important. And I don't know. I've, I I feel myself being tempted to to uh, you, you know say some things that that may disquiet people, and I, I don't mean to be provocative, but but I think that our society um, and and I'm there's many more things involved here that I don't know than than I, than I do. So <laughs> and I want I, I don't want to overstate my case or, or come across as an arrogant critic of our society, which I am not. But but it does seem uh, that we're living in a time where our future is not clear to us. And, and we've had a long run following World War II uh, as a dominant power without, without a real second. I mean, the, the Cold War, yes, it was a struggle for dominance. And we kind of won that. Uh, and, and since then, our number one status has started starting to decline. Our, our population is, is aging, for one. Um, and then we have a we have a racial and and a, a racial problem in this country. So so that uh, racial groups that that are younger and growing more or have more vitality, uh, a lot of white people are really uncomfortable with that, and and they actually deliberately are trying to hold it back because they're unsure whether the thing that they feel entitled to. Uh, this number one status and the perks that come out of it could be lost to them. I mean, and it's self-interested. Uh, and some of them might be actually bad people, uh, but, but most aren't. They're just very unsure. Uh, and, and the country is not doing a good job hanging together and defining a way of being a single country. And and the project of education is one of those things in public education at the, at, at the K through 12 level and, pre, and pre-K is an area where the country is meant to be investing in its own future. And, you know, a part of what we have right now strikes me, uh, may not strike a lot, but strikes me, is that we want things, but we don't want to pay for them. There's, a, there's a, a, a bit of a selfishness about what we, we want to keep, we want our taxes to be as low as, but we don't want to pay an extra penny. Right. Um, in, 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 and we want to push off the costs of the future through, through debt and through buying of bonds and this sort of stuff. And there becomes a point at which you can't do that. You have to pay for education and it's very costly. And if you do it well, it's costlier. You can't keep saving money by efficiency. I mean, it, yeah, yes, and you never want to waste money and all that's true. Right. But it's an investment in our own future as a country. And what, what, what I know goads some people is that it should be, you know, equitable and it should reflect a complete diversity and it should include everyone. And it shouldn't be that one racial group is always finding a way to plot its own future and hold others back. And um, where that is a motive, and it is a motive in some politics, there should be no question about it. Those of us that have a different view on it need to exercise our political and our moral and our social uh, judgment to push for something better because that's our responsibility. 
and it's something that I'm committed to. And higher education institutions, really around the United States, maybe a bit late to it, but they are all now trying to lean into that kind of project. And let's lean into it with them because it's really important. I agree. I agree with everything you just said. I would just add, you know, and I, and I say this a lot, and I'm sure where I work and the people I work with are so tired of me saying this, but 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 I just think it's, it's so, stop talking and start doing. You know, we can all talk. I can sit here and talk to you for hours about something, but if I don't do anything about it, I'm just wasting breath. You know, so if you really are interested in a unified country, do unified things. You know, if you promote one group or another, you're dividing yourself. And we have done such a good job of segmenting ourselves into silos, right? So you've got black, white, brown, yellow, red, and any other color we can come up with. We've got male, female, gay, bisexual, and you, you just keep going because we keep set. And by the time we've segmented ourselves down to this finite thing, we are so separate from each other, as opposed to being whatever we are, which in my mind are just human beings. And as long as you're human beings, you have a common interest. And that is the well-being of your world. We have this thing. So if we pollute our world, if we undereducate our children, if we have strife and war and, and poverty and all these things, we are continually to separate ourselves and segment ourselves so that countries like China, you know, countries that are huge and are figuring out this technology thing will overtake us in a while because they are forcing their people to be one thing, whether they want to or not. I don't think that's a good thing. And I would not want to be in a place where somebody said we had to do this. But you have countries like China that are going to eventually surpass the United States as the number one power because they are so large and they are so effective at what they do. And as opposed to us, the policies and practices that we keep, the rich and the poor, so we got the haves and the have not. So that's a really good dichotomy, right? So, you know, somebody's going to go live on Mars and the rest of us are going to be left down here on this polluted planet. Well, okay, there you go. So there's that kind of thing. And we promote those kind of stories all the time. So every time you turn on the news, I, I can't turn on the news without seeing somebody's going to Mars. Well, obviously I'm not going to Mars. I don't think they've made a plan for me to go. So I'm going to be left here. So you further separate your people and separate your ideas. And I do think if there is a way to come together as a society, why we care so much about race, I have no idea. Why we care so much about gender, I have no idea because I don't know what that means. You know, even the religious piece, I'm not sure I understand what that means. We all worship God. What is God to us? You know, your God may not be the same, but my God, but it's still God whatever that is, however you identify with that person. And if you don't uh, uh, worship any God, you still worship something, whether it's just yourself or money or something, you still worship something. So I just think that in our society, we should do more about bringing ourselves together under a common purpose. And that is the well-being of our country and each other. And if we can't do anything else, that's, that's minimally the thing that we should do. And tools like education is just an exceptional tools to help us achieve that. The question is, do we use it for good or do we use it for bad? Well, that's uh, very, very passionately put. Uh, the, the only little qualifier I'd give, uh, and it, it, I think it's substantive, uh, it could be stated as a little thing, is that belonging and that we're all human beings, you know, we're together, strikes me as exactly right. But people's identities Sometimes that kind of universalist language can be used to make people feel like they should really be another white person, you know, and, and that's where the question of identity, it's proper that people get to be who they are and they get to assert it and when, when needed make demands on the rest of us. So I think that's like a, a friendly amendment to what you said, but the idea that we should uh, work together for a larger and that education is is essential to that. Count me count me on board with that idea for sure. Absolutely, but I, I I'm not saying you shouldn't have your identity. I mean, you know, I, I I whoever you are, you should be. But the point is, it should not be to the exclusion or the exception or or the empowering of one over another. You know, if I'm a black woman, I should not 
have any kind of feeling other than sisterhood to a white woman or a Hispanic woman or a Latino woman or Indian woman. We are both, we're women. We are women. And so that kind of identity is that unifying thing in the right to vote and all the other things that we have accomplished. We accomplished because we are women, not because we are white or black or whatever it is, we were this thing. But, you know, I, I am so grateful for your time. I hope all goes well with your reunification of your university and all the things that you are working on. And uh, I hope you will stay in touch and let me know how things are going. And if there's anything I can do to help, I am more than happy to do so. And uh, once this video converts, I will send you a link. Please watch it. Uh, let me know if you like it. And if you think we can upload it, let me know that. And um, stay in touch. You know, please stay in touch and let me know how things are going. And again, if I can help, I can help any way I can. Sorry, uh, one of my children dropped something in the background there. But no, and thank you for your time. It was a good conversation. I've, I've learned a lot from you. And I'm, I'm glad we did this. And I'll look for that link. And Absolutely, we'll stay in touch. Absolutely, thank you so much, and good luck. I hope all goes well. I, you know, what in the end of June, we pray, we pray for all the blessings for you going forward. Whatever you need to be successful, good luck with that. Thanks so much. Good thank to you. talk to yourself. You bye too. Bye.